from ABC News. A television event. 100 years in the making. A century. Christmas 1973, Quang Tri province in Vietnam. We invited the South Vietnamese into our bunker and drank tea and smoked North Vietnamese cigarettes. For many naive soldiers, you know, the war seemed to be over. But the following day, when we invited them back to our bunker, before they left, they dropped a hand grenade into our bunker. My friend was very quick to catch it and throw it up. That guy died on the bunker. Then the war went on. The century. No man's land. For 20 years, the bloody struggle between North and South Vietnam wore on, drawing in the Cold War powers, locked in bitter stalemate. And then on December the 13th, 1974, everything changed. The North Vietnamese launched a full-scale assault on the South Vietnamese province of Phuc Long, only 75 miles from Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital. Only North Vietnamese cameras filmed the assault. Most Western journalists had left when America's fighting troops went home. As their defenses crumbled, South Vietnam's leaders turned to their American ally for support. They sent their ambassador, Bui Diem, to Washington. By the time I arrived to Washington, there was practically no people to talk to. Dr. Kissinger was in the Middle East. President Ford was in Vail, Colorado for uh, skiing. President Ford and most Americans wanted to forget a war that had cost so many lives and achieved so little. But it was a war that had not yet ended. In Washington, they all talked about this war in the, in the past tense, as if it were over, as if this peace agreement had been successful. Arnold Isaacs was in Saigon reporting for the Baltimore Sun. He realized that the battle for Phuc Long marked a whole new phase in the war. This was the first time in the whole war that the commies had taken an objective and they could hold it. They weren't going to get kicked out. This is the most serious military situation in South Vietnam since the new American commander-in-chief took office. White House officials say it is obvious the South Vietnamese are going to have to hack it on their own. By January the 8th, 1975, the entire province of Phuc Long had fallen to the North Vietnamese. For many South Vietnamese, like former Second Lieutenant Nguyen Ngoc Nan, the truth had not yet sunk in. We still believe that at the last minute, we will be rescued by the American power. We kept waiting, waiting until nothing happened. America's inaction sent a clear signal to the North Vietnamese. They had a green light to undo the South. While many people in the United States seemed indifferent, in Washington, a small group with close ties to Vietnam watched in alarm. We had the advantage of looking, in, our, in my position in particular, at all of the intelligence that was coming in about what the North Vietnamese were doing. Lionel Rosenblatt, then at the State Department in Washington, had spent years in South Vietnam as a civilian advisor. So had his State Department colleague, Craig Johnstone. We tried to assess how many Vietnamese had associated themselves with us to the extent that they would be at risk uh, if North Vietnam took over the South. And that number ran up as high as a million people. We saw that the North Vietnamese were gathering steam in a tremendously rapid and effective fashion. And that to us was a very, very alarming development. I think both Lionel and I had come to the conclusion that it was going to be a very unpleasant future for those who stayed on in Vietnam. And yet Graham Martin was there, our ambassador in Saigon, reporting that things were looking quite rosy and 
not to worry, et cetera, et cetera. Ambassador Graham Martin, an old school cold warrior, was determined to put a good face on the situation. He continually downplayed the troubles facing the regime of South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu. Thieu's limited popularity with the South Vietnamese people hinged on his ability to deliver U.S. military and economic assistance. By 1975, Thieu's luck had run out. Two years of drastic cuts in American military aid had left the South Vietnamese army demoralized. The situation was very, very serious because it, it affected the moral of the fighting troops. The South Vietnamese received just a few hundred millions of dollars in terms of economic aid. It was not enough to feed the military people, the military machine of South Vietnam. On March the 10th, 1975, the North Vietnamese launched a surprise attack on Bon Mai Tuat in the Central Highlands, and by doing so, threatened to cut South Vietnam in half. President Thieu was stunned. He decided too late to consolidate his forces, ordering all troops in the Central region to withdraw immediately. And so the South Vietnamese retreat began from Play Coup. It was in Play Coup in 1965 that an attack had triggered the buildup of U.S. troops in Vietnam. The retreating soldiers had their families stationed with them, and the escape route quickly became jammed as thousands of women and children rushed to get out. We picked up intelligence indicating that the South Vietnamese Army was strung out among civilians in one of the roads leading, leading from the highlands to the coast. Frank Snap was a CIA analyst at the embassy in Saigon. And as the civilians in the army became intermingled and get, began to back up at a stream crossing very close to the coast, the North Vietnamese just swept out of the highlands and crushed them. They destroyed most of the retreating forces from the highlands. Looking back, I don't think anybody could prevent that disaster because uh, that was the first time the Vietnamese troops received an order from the president or from the general who gave order to withdraw. Withdraw means surrender, means giving up. And that gave the panic to the whole people. The panic mounted when President Thieu abruptly pulled his best troops out of yet another region farther north. He wanted to create a protected enclave around Saigon. The troops left behind in the north knew they had been abandoned, and many of them broke ranks and fled even before the North Vietnamese attacked. They left their last stockpiles of weapons and ammunition behind. In the final days of March, the coastal cities of South Vietnam fell like dominoes. Hundreds of thousands of refugees began pouring into the port city of Da Nang. I saw a steamrolling effect, almost like an avalanche. There would be no way that you would sustain the morale necessary to keep the rest of the, uh, the region and then to maintain this so-called enclave that they were talking about. Teresa Tull was second in command at the consulate in Da Nang. They began evacuating their Vietnamese co-workers immediately. We were influenced very heavily by the behavior of the communists in Hue during the Tet Offensive in 1968 when they killed just about everybody affiliated that they could find with the Vietnamese government. Robert Greeley, a political officer at the consulate, remembers how desperate the South Vietnamese were when an airlift from Da Nang was organized. The mobs were getting a hold of vehicles and they were chasing the airplanes up and down the runway. The plane would never stop, it would only slow down and we try to get people onto the airplane. It became wild and dangerous. The South Vietnamese rushed to the beaches where the first American troops had arrived exactly a decade earlier. Now tens of thousands of refugees were swarming onto barges and merchant marine boats summoned by urgent calls of SOS.
as the civilians were coming up the gangway onto the ship or climbing up the ladders onto the ship. They were being robbed uh, and beaten uh, by armed troops. South Vietnamese soldiers, also desperate to escape, were fighting for space. They were killing people uh, who resisted them. It was insane. I don't know how many people drowned in the Han River that night, but there were a lot of them. I believed very deeply in what the United States was trying to do in Vietnam, and I believe that when the United States gives its word, we should stick with it. And to be in a position where you have given commitments and, in effect, as a nation, we tired of it, and you're on the scene and you have to tell these people that you have gotten to know and care for and work with daily that, well, I'm very sorry, but you know how it is politically in the United States. Good luck, I'm going home and I'm going home to my nice free country where I'll be comfortable and you stay here and face the future. It, it was devastating to me personally. Da Nang fell to the North Vietnamese on March the 30th. The entire northern region, two thirds of South Vietnam, was now in their hands. The map was changing with dizzying speed. And after years of not changing at all, I, I can't begin to uh, convey, I don't think, how unreal this seemed, that all of a sudden this war was taking this completely new and unexpected shape in front of our eyes. I and mean, I was there, and I couldn't believe it. Ambassador Martin was not there to witness the collapse of the northern areas. He had gone back to the U.S. for dental surgery. Frank Snepp briefed him when he got back to Saigon. I said, so, Mr. Ambassador, half of the South Vietnamese army has been destroyed. He looked at me incredulously and he said, uh, I don't believe it, Frank. With the loss of Da Nang, Way, and with the North Vietnamese juggernaut, coming down Highway 1 towards Saigon. Uh, all of us felt under terrible pressure. Stuart Harrington, an Army intelligence officer, had worked alongside the South Vietnamese for several years. Many of us had Vietnamese friends. Uh, we had friends in the States who had Vietnamese wives, Vietnamese relatives in, in Vietnam who needed to get out. And we looked to the embassy, and of course, Ambassador Martin was still maintaining that there was no real emergency, there was no need to panic, no need for an evacuation. I think the government can handle it in the future, can become self-sufficient, can keep their freedom, and allow us, when we end our involvement here, to withdraw, as I think we should, leaving South Vietnam economically viable militarily capable of defending itself with its own manpower and free to choose its own government, its own leaders, as its people themselves may freely determine. This is a goal which is easily within our reach. Ambassador Martin knew that while he was giving that interview, North Vietnamese troops were fighting only 40 miles east of Saigon. It seemed almost like it was a sense of denial. Uh, we had, uh, even right up to the end, the embassy was reporting back in ways that led one to believe that they didn't think that an, the imminent collapse of Saigon or, or, or Vietnam was, was likely. We kept developing the notion that we ought to at least salvage a little bit of honor by, if we were running away in Vietnam, affording the people who worked closely with us a chance to come. Ambassador Martin went in, I think it was on the 18th of April, to discuss the possibility of an evacuation with President Thieu. His cable traffic coming out after that meeting essentially led us to believe that he had no plans at all for the evacuation of the Vietnamese who had worked with us loyally in, in Vietnam. Martin did allow contingency planning for the evacuation of American personnel to begin, but his priority was to not create a general panic by moving too quickly. We had a very delicate operation to conduct there, because if you showed too much eagerness, uh, then the whole thing could collapse. The Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, was following the situation very closely. So I was not as negative on Martin as most of the bureaucracy was, and he was sort of on board uh, to get people out, but he was, uh, he was dragging his feet, there's no doubt about it. 
By April the 20th, North Vietnamese divisions were moving on Saigon from three directions. The fact that the Vietnamese were going to be left in the lurch was extremely troubling to us, uh, beyond troubling. It was unacceptable. I went in, I recall, to Craig's office and said that I'm, I'm going back and I think I can at least find a few of the people that, um, that I used to work with. And um, are you interested in going? And he said, um, just without hesitation, yes, if you think we can make a difference. John Stone and Rosenblatt told no one of their plans. Risking their State Department careers, they headed for Vietnam. They got on the last American commercial flight to land in Saigon. On April the 22nd, 1975, when Craig John Stone and Lionel Rosenblatt landed in Saigon, they were determined to help the South Vietnamese, whose lives were in danger, leave the country while they could. With the North Vietnamese army poised to attack, they found the mood in Saigon was not what they expected. The impression that one got there was sort of surreal. There was tension in the streets, but even there, people didn't know for sure what was going to happen, and some people dismissing the fact that there was even a realistic threat. Uh, a very bizarre situation. The capital had been cordoned off to keep out the refugees fleeing from the north. The South Vietnamese government and the U.S. Ambassador Graham Martin were determined to keep the chaos from spilling into Saigon. You wouldn't know that anything difficult was about to face this city. So in that sense, Graham Martin had done his job superbly, and uh, the Vietnamese were just in blissful ignorance. And uh, so we, knew we were much more apprehensive than the people we were running into. For many South Vietnamese, it was hard to believe that the United States, after spending $150 billion and losing 58,000 American lives, was just going to look the other way. Ambassador Bui Diem, just returning from Washington, was one of the few South Vietnamese in a position to understand. At this time, there are still a lot of hopes in Saigon about the Americans. But my message to all of them was crystal clear. For the American, the war ended already. The issue is with everybody was, why are we rushing so fast? Uh, I'd like some time to get organized, get hold of my assets, say goodbye to my parents, et cetera, et cetera. And we would say, we would look at our watches and say, you don't have that much time. And essentially, if you knew someone and you were at risk, you probably had a chance of getting out. Um, if you didn't, uh, if you were not privy to what was taking place, and it happened very quickly, then you got left behind. When Rosenblatt and Johnstone stopped by the embassy, they heard that the State Department was furious at their unauthorized mission and had actually issued warrants for their arrest. So we spent about 10 seconds in the embassy and sped off. But that was very useful because we got the names and numbers then of people at the airport who were uh, forming the beginning of this evacuation network. Out at Tonsonut Airport, the military did get the ambassador's approval to begin a low profile evacuation, in contrast to the inaction at the embassy itself. Non-essential personnel, Dependents and select Vietnamese were being airlifted out under the command of General Homer Smith. I passed the word out that we would evacuate all of our people, Vietnamese or Americans, who wanted to go, and their families. We would bring people into our compound and house them overnight, and then build them into movable packets and ship them out. We spent those last couple of weeks working almost full time day and night, pumping people out as fast as we could by every rouge and subterfuge uh, that you can imagine. So in my case, I borrowed a freezer truck from a friend who was running his own black operations. It had an embassy license plate on it. And I used that truck to take out a number of my intelligence officer friends and their families, just stuffed them in the truck, locked them in there, and sneaked them onto the air base, and stuck them on an airplane and got them out. At that time, I could not find anybody to help me to, to flee the country. Nan, the former soldier, was rushing around Saigon on a scooter with his wife and one-year-old son on the back. And everybody asked each other, do you have any way to leave the country? Do you have any connection with the American or e even the Filipinos or who worked in there before and they can bring you out? Can you help me? Something like that. 
a lot of worry question. We didn't begin to touch the total number of people at risk. So some got out, some didn't get out. It was very, very ad hoc. Between them, John Stone and Rosenblatt think they got around 500 people out before they too departed. That week, South Vietnam's President Thieu resigned in a tearful speech blaming the United States for abandoning South Vietnam. Thieu's Vice President, Chan Van Huang, was inaugurated only to be replaced within days by yet another politician, Zong Van Min. There was a strange political intrigue, meaning nothing. This, this sort of play that they were putting on, no connection at all to the, the reality of what was happening to them. In a cable to the White House, Ambassador Martin continued to express confidence in the government of South Vietnam, while President Ford made his position very clear in a speech at Tulane University. Today, America can regain the sense of pride that existed before Vietnam. But it cannot be achieved by refighting a war that is finished, as far as America is concerned. On the morning of April the 29th, 1975, the North Vietnamese final offensive began with a rocket attack on Saigon's Tonsonut Air Base. About 3 o'clock, morning of the 29th, uh, my wife and I were blown out of bed. Two American Marines were killed, the last Americans to die in Vietnam. Columns of smoke towering up from the air base and the sound of the explosions, you know, the population was extremely agitated. The streets were jammed with panic-stricken Vietnamese already. It was about 5.30 in the morning. Everyone was heading for the embassy walls. The embassy plan was for the embassy employees to be taken in, I believe, six pre-positioned buses that were in the embassy grounds out to the air base to fly out. The plan had to change. The North Vietnamese rockets had damaged the runways. The backup plan called for helicopters. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, we've got 140,000 North Vietnamese forces within 20 minutes of downtown Saigon, and he wouldn't believe it. Nor would he believe that the airstrikes had destroyed the runways at Tan San Ut, as our American military attaché out there said they had. He insisted on going out and seeing for himself. And I had one of the officers brief him on the situation. He said, well, he's going to go back to his office and think about it. As Ambassador Martin continued to think about calling in the helicopters, the crowds outside the embassy began to get larger. The CIA's own helicopters were already coming and going, taking their own endangered contacts out to the 7th Fleet, sitting off the coast in the South China Sea. It was mid-morning. Air America choppers were moving from the roof of the embassy to various buildings around Saigon to pick up Vietnamese who couldn't get over the walls. There was an old chopper pilot, O.B. Harnage. He spearheaded that helicopter airlift that morning, the improvisatory one. That famous picture of the Vietnamese climbing up a ladder to a roof and a chopper on the roof and a man leaning down to help them up, that was Harnage. That rooftop was the deputy CIA station chief's house. And some of the most imperiled Vietnamese were those climbing that ladder. Harnage got him out. By now, a 1,000 people had gathered at the embassy, hoping to be evacuated. The ambassador had anticipated only 200. There was a flurry of phone calls between the White House, General Smith, and the embassy, pressuring the ambassador for a decision on the airlift. I called the ambassador, and I said, Mr. Ambassador, there's no way we're going to get out of here on fixed-wing aircraft. He said, are you sure of that? I said, yes, sir. He said, OK. So he called. And that was about 10.30 in the morning, Go for the rotary wing evacuation. Finally, Ambassador Martin had agreed, and the White House and the Pentagon began the massive helicopter operation codenamed Frequent Wind. We knew the Vietnamese were going to be in Saigon the next morning, so we had to get out whatever we could that day. We had an ambassador who didn't want to leave, so we couldn't fully rely on his judgment. Uh, of the situation. So uh, 
And the Pentagon, quite frankly, had made me the fall guy and made me... I, was, I had to authorize every helicopter so that if one got shut down, uh, there was a designated victim. Although the command was given at 11 a.m., no helicopters appeared for hours. And then happened one of these classic screw-ups. The Pentagon had not agreed on what time to use. Greenwich Mean Time, Asian Time, Washington Time. And we actually had to get every helicopter back, sit them down again, <laughs> and say it's not. So we wasted a f couple of hours that way. The embassy was now an island amidst a sea of humanity. And to get through the gates, you had to find an American on the other side who knew you and some pushed and shoved to get through those gates. I saw some people crying, some people sneaking, and some people tried to push some other people. It was a very messy uh, uh, scene. Inside the embassy, they were frantically shredding documents. Then Ambassador Martin announced that he wanted to burn some files left at his residence, which was several blocks away. I said, oh, Mr. Ambassador, don't do that. I, you know, we got 4,000 people outside now clamoring at the gates. Marine Major Jim Keene was in charge of embassy security. We attempted to get the gate open. And then I came back and said, that's no, not going to happen. He got out, he was madder than hell, he slammed the door, and he decided to walk. So we had to throw together a detail of, of Marines to block the crowds and try to, you know, everybody was armed to the teeth, and he walked down to the residence. They used thermite grenades to destroy the files. Martin, uh, almost in a fit of pique, told one of the Marines to set off a thermite grenade on his grand piano. He didn't want anybody using it. He was just in a state of total collapse. Almost a pathetic figure, as a matter of fact. Uh, I had great sympathy for him. Colonel Harry Summers had come from the air base to assist with the embassy evacuation. Ambassador Martin's world was coming to an end. I mean, everything that he'd been sent over there to do, everything that he believed in, uh, it was, was uh, going, turning sour. Major Keene finally waved in the first helicopters at 3 p.m. Saigon time. The recreation compound next door to the embassy became a holding area for the 2,000 or so now inside the embassy's walls. Small groups were taken into the interior courtyard. A landing zone had been cleared. A tree was cut down so the huge transport helicopters could land safely. 90 on a CH-53, 50 on a CH-46, feeding refugees up through the stairwell in the embassy to the rooftop, marshalling them by the firehouse to get into the helicopters in the parking lot, and uh, really pumping out a lot of people. In the largest helicopter evacuation on record, Marine helicopters flew over 600 missions that day and night, taking more than 1,000 Americans and nearly 6,000 Vietnamese to the aircraft carriers waiting offshore. Every time we saw a helicopter taking off, we felt even, um, even worse. We felt that we are left behind. How come those people are, are luckier than us? I stood there with my wife without no hope. I know that. I knew that I could not get into there. So finally I went home and just waited for the uh, destiny, for the fate to come. As 16 North Vietnamese divisions encircled Saigon, skirmishes broke out on the city limits. This scene at Newport Bridge on the outskirts of Saigon is the proof, if any proof is needed, that the communist forces are finally closing in on the capital. This is the closest the fighting has ever come to Saigon since the communist offensive in 1968. Story from ABC News, Saigon. On the afternoon of the 29th, with the fall of Saigon imminent, the crowds of South Vietnamese outside the gates of the embassy were growing desperate.
there was a terrible emotional drama going on at those gates, and those young Marines were in a very stressful situation. Because those who were clambering to get in were holding letters, crying out that they worked for Mr. Hunter. I work, Secretary Mr. Hunter, please, please let me in. I can't live with the communists. And it was a heart-rending set of circumstances. Inside the compound, Harrington and others who spoke Vietnamese tried to maintain calm among the 2,000 lucky enough to be there. I persistently reassured the crowds in Vietnamese that everyone would go, that no one would be left behind. Kong Ai Sa Bi Bo Lai was the phrase. Nobody will be left behind. As long as we're here, you're safe, and nobody's going to leave us behind, and we are not leaving until the last helicopter. So please, relax, get in line, stay in family groups, and you've got to get rid of your luggage. The helicopters can only take people, not suitcases. Out of the airport, the airlift had gone quite smoothly. The military took out more than 4,000 people. But here at the embassy, a communications problem was developing. Periodically, they'd ask from the fleet, you know, how many people are left in the embassy? And throughout that uh, late the 29th and right up through around uh, midnight, there's a terrible problem which becomes a credibility gap where the embassy appears to Washington to be a bottomless pit. The belief in Washington was that Ambassador Martin had lost his objectivity and was trying to evacuate all of Saigon through the conduit of the U.S. Embassy, and the embassy evacuation would go on until halted because Martin was just going to stubbornly stay there and keep putting people out. Dr. Kissinger and Defense Secretary James Schlesinger discussed ending the airlift. I said, how many people are there? He said, 700. I said, how many does it take to get them out? He said, 13 helicopters. So I said, OK, let's use 19 as a safety factor. And the ambassador has to be on the 19th helicopter. But when Washington was given the number 700, there may have actually been twice that many people waiting. Kissinger really needed yet another six helicopters to get everyone out. Whereas on the ground, we are whittling away at the number so that by 3 in the morning, uh, we're down to 420 refugees. Six or eight more helicopters, and it would be a clean sweep. They didn't know we were down to six loads. I mean, nobody knew that except us. Colonel Summers, along with Harrington and their commanding officer, Colonel John Madison, had no idea that the White House had ordered the airlift to end. It was never communicated to us. We were caught somewhat by surprise when I think it was the ambassador's assistant uh, came down, in fact, and lied to us and said that the lift was continuing, stay there on the LZ, that the helicopters would be coming in, and he went up and left. I mean, the only time in 38 years of military service I had ever been lied to in an operational matter. We just kept loading helicopters till all of a sudden there wasn't any more helicopters. Then, uh-oh, what's going on? At the same time, the helicopter control sent out this tagger tagger, which is the signal to say that the next bird in the zone takes the ambassador out. And that, and that order had come from Washington, D.C. The ambassador's helicopter had arrived from the aircraft carrier Okinawa. With that, I dropped and I ran down into the ambassador's office. Martin was still sorting files. I said, the president directs you to leave. And he looked up, you know, and over his glasses and fixed me. And, and he said, uh, all in good time, young major, you know, and uh, everybody knew what that meant. He just froze me. But at that time, Martin looked up at Wolf Lehman and he said, Wolf, I guess it's time to go. And at that point, Major Jim Keene, who's running the Marine security guards, approaches Colonel Madison and tells Colonel Madison, sir, it's over, only Americans from now on. And Colonel Madison says, uh, the hell, I've got a commitment. We need six more birds to get these people out, and we've been promised them. And Major Keene, as I recall it, uh, says something to the effect of, sir, not going to happen. It's a presidential order. Madison said, I'm going to speak to the ambassador. And, and I, as we watched the 46 lift off the roof of the ambassador, and I said, there you go. I said, this is no nonsense, Colonel. It's, it's time. There are no more helicopters. And it dawns on Colonel Madison, Summers, and myself that 
we've been had. Maybe not by malice, but by circumstances. When we found out that we'd been lied to and that the evacuation helicopters were not coming and were told to surreptit surreptitiously make our way from the landing zone into the embassy and to abandon these last loads, it was absolute feeling of shame, a feeling of disgust uh, toward the United States and the whole operation. I was sitting on the, the hood of a black sedan with its headlights pointing out into the landing zone. And, and I sat there with the radio, um, pretending to talk to helicopters that I knew weren't out there, and saying to those people, don't worry, a large big helicopter, about to come. There was no question that this pile of people in the parking lot were going to get left. It crossed my mind that maybe I should stay. And then I thought, you know, you'll never get these people out. The Marine Guards are leaving. And with that, I excused myself to the Vietnamese, said, Mat I have to go to the bathroom. Went through over to a little house that was in the embassy compound, through the bushes, spirited, you know, got myself into the embassy and headed for the roof. Around 5.30 in the morning, the last of the helicopters ordered by Kissinger touched down. We got on that helicopter, and uh, the helicopter lifted off the roof. I looked down in the parking lot, and of course there were the people lined up in their groups of 50, and they were, of course, I knew, the last victims, the victims of the final betrayal of the war. And the helicopter banked and headed out of Saigon, and we went to the Okinawa. On the morning of April the 30th, North Vietnamese tanks crashed through the gates of the presidential palace in Saigon, and within hours, South Vietnam's President Min had surrendered. I received announcement of surrender as a disgrace, and uh, we felt ashamed about that. As North Vietnamese troops took over Saigon, Nguyen Ngoc Nan went about destroying evidence of his past in the South Vietnamese army. We put the gun down to the well, uh, on the uniforms, on the albums from the academy and from the military services. I put everything in the well and we covered it. And we started the new life from, from then on. Out at sea, America's 7th Fleet was swarming with refugees. As space on the decks became scarce, millions of dollars in equipment was simply thrown overboard. Helicopters were ditched at sea. And I remember thinking, you know, what an utter, total, useless waste the whole thing turned out to have been. All of, all of this. I mean, I wasn't thinking about the politics of it or the right and wrong of the policy, but just all those years, all that blood, all that fear, all of it had turned out just to be for nothing, absolutely for nothing. Official Washington had very little of note to say about the events in Indochina. Senate Democratic leader Mansfield told reporters, the fewer post-mortems, the better. It's time to start afresh. I fully expected when we returned, not just I, but all of us in positions of responsibility returned to Washington, we would be formally debriefed. What were the last days like? What lessons can we learn? This, 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 and this. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody wanted to learn the lessons of the fall. It was too humiliating. When I came back to CIA headquarters in the aftermath, the attitude was, forget. Go on to the next assignment. Lionel Rosenblatt and Craig Johnstone were called in for a meeting at the State Department. When Lionel and I made it back to Washington, we were summoned into Kissinger's office, and we were told beforehand that our lives were in his hands. I mean, it was one of these things where we had already figured long before that we had a, a better than a 50-50 chance of being fired. So I heard one day that two of the Foreign Service officers had just taken off and uh, gone to Vietnam to save people they knew and people that had worked with us, which is a total violation of every State Department rule. And we walked in, and uh, he said in that typical Kissinger voice, is it true what I read about you guys? And we said, substantially, yes. And I mumbled some disapproval of what they had done. And then I said to them, I'm extremely proud of you. 
and uh, you did exactly what we as a country should be doing. And you two guys have been some of the few who've done the right thing, and we're very proud of you and want to congratulate you. And uh, we were astonished, of course. We spent a lot of time then talking about the issue of, of Vietnam as a whole. Was there any way to have handled it differently? Um, once we were in it, would, could we have extracted ourselves in a smoother way than the way that we did? In a very real sense, that last drama, that last scene of the last tragic act in the courtyard of the embassy was a microcosm for the war as a whole. Because at the beginning, we told the Vietnamese around 1964 to uh, stand up and fight, we're with you. And uh, when we told the Vietnamese that, in our uh, idealism and our naivete and our sense of being omnipotent, we meant it. And in the end, of course, uh, we made that commitment in good faith, but we were unable to carry it out and uh, we wound up betraying the country. And that's just what happened in a smaller sense in that last hour in the embassy courtyard in Saigon on the 30th of April, 1975. In the end, America left behind tens of thousands of people who'd relied on the United States to protect them. Most ended up in what the North Vietnamese called re-education camps, Nguyen Ngoc Nan among them. After his release in 1978, Nan and his wife and their four-year-old son fled Vietnam by boat. Their boat sank off the coast of Malaysia. Nan managed to get ashore. His wife and his son died. I'm Peter Jennings, for The Century. Good night.